And a very good afternoon once again from uh, Tilbach, the Sarensburg Wine Estate, and another episode of Inside uh, the uh, of uh, Inside Eight Days of Courage. My apologies. Uh, a breezy day today. So it's, it's a lot windier than it was yesterday. But uh, a another uh, another tough day, another tough stage out there. And joining me today is Mike Flynn. He's uh, been uh, with the Epsa Cape Epic for 10 years, a 10-year crew member. He's also GM of the Epsa Cape Epic, and we're joined by Team Galileo Risk. We'll be uh, chatting to them a little later. But first, let's have a look back at the news of the day. Benetton 58 second lead into the 93 kilometer stage two, which was the 100th in the 13 year history of the race. The rough, loose climb up the Witzenberg Mountains thinned the field out quickly with the 2012 world champion Pericles Ilias and his Dolomiti superbike teammate Tiago Ferreira setting the pace, closely followed by the yellow jerseys of Platt and Uber. Absa Africa leaders Darren Lill and Waylon Wilcock were in the second group of riders that included second placed overall Topi Gergen. Once into the valley, the lead group was back together again with all the major protagonists and their supporting teams in attendance. The geology in the valley lends itself to the creation of superb single track and the bulls showed their class as they pushed hard, snaking in and out of the massive rock formations. Topi Gogon's hopes were dented when Lakata stopped at water point two to change a troublesome right shoe, swapping with backup team member Eric Kleinans. The second place team would later lose more time to a puncture. Third place Dolomiti Superbike also stopped and later broke a handlebar, ending their hopes of a stage win. On the final climb, the Churin Bada Mirandal, Nicola Robach and Matthias Frommer pulled themselves up to and eventually passed the Bulls pair. The four descended back into the Tilbach Valley, but halfway down, Huber punctured. The Bulls lost over three minutes in the repair, and that allowed Robach and Frommer to gallop for the finish. They crossed the line after four hours and 16 minutes for their first stage win. The Bulls were just over three minutes back in second. For me, it's the first time in the Cape Epic, and uh, yeah, to win the 100 up the Cape Epic stage, we never expect this, or it was not our goal. So, um, yeah, but I think we we say thank you to uh, our team one that that um, they told us yeah we can go and uh, we we not have to wait because of the crash from Hermann. So yeah. Sport for good. Sabine Spitz and Jana Bellamoyna made the early pace in the Sassel women's race. But it was Topi Gergen, Sally Bigham and Adele Marath who were the day's big aggressors and led the race into the final descent. However, Spurs specialised attack from third place on the narrow trail. Kleinans on the front and Langfeld following as they passed Spitz and Bellamoyna and then Bigham and Morath before riding into Sarensburg for their first stage win and with it the overall lead. That was some of the action that played out on today's stage two of the 2016 Absa Cape Epic and it also was the 100th stage uh, of the race. Mike, you being around for a long time, uh, ten-year crew member, did the stage live up to, to its reputation? Was it worthy of, of 100 <laughs> stages? Um, Jeff, uh, thanks very much for having me. Uh, today's stage, you know, there are so many stages that stand out over the years. Um, today, I think, if you look at the combinations of the stages that we've had, I think the Root team have done an exceptional job, and I think we'll hear from the from the guests a little bit later. The um, the the combinations over the over the distance, um, the the climbing, the the ups and downs, uh, it's uh, it's definitely something epic. Is there anything in particular that stands out in your mind looking back over the years? Well, um, for me, for me, Jeff, I look at I look at many different aspects of the race um, in my in my roles. Um, you've you've got the riding side of things, where you've got these guys who are busting the busting themselves open all day every day for eight days solid and then you've got the guys behind the scenes the unsung heroes and um, those guys that have uh, they get up at 3 2:33 uh, o'clock in the morning and they're going to sleep at the same time the next day just to make everything work um, in the race villages so that there's food for for the riders for the for the rest of the crew members the passion that they showed to get these riders to the finish line really really speaks volumes well, we know that uh, the African uh, jersey for the men is Darren Lill and Day and uh, Waylon uh, are out front, but we've got the top African ladies with us uh, in studio today. Uh, welcome to Galileo Risk, uh, Teresa Ralph and Yolandi Detoy. Guys, thanks very much for joining us. Thank you for having us. The obvious question today, your stage, stage two, uh, how did it go? just 
continued to carry on and on and on. And um, I think Cape Epic, it always does that to you. And at the end of the stage, we had to come down that climb, <laughs> which actually <laughs> <laughs> was almost as hard as going up it because it's, it's loose, it's rutted. There's some drop-offs that you need to be very wary about. And um, so, yes, we started off hard and we ended off hard in true Cape Epic style. Yeah, and we've got on screen, we've got uh, some footage of that climb. Um, Yolandi, from, from your point of view, uh, were, were you happy with the way it went today? I think waking up, it was clear it was going to be another hot day. Well, at least uh, after yesterday's uh, stage, we, um, we experienced also obviously a very hard day, and so we could prepare accordingly today. And uh, we made sure we stopped at all the water points to fill up our bottles. And um, like Teresa said, today was a very hard stage. I must say for the 100th stage, they really made us think about it, or well, we suffered a lot. So um, it will definitely, I'll remember it for another 100 days. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it was a good start. <coughs> and always riding in the Witzenberg Valley. It's a beautiful area and the trails there is, it's really um, a mountain biker's, not, I won't say dream, but it is it's great riding, so I must say I think it's the Anacom brothers that designed the course, and mm. your thanks to them, it's a brilliant course, very tough on the body, but uh, we enjoyed it. Yeah. The back markers, I mean, as we sit here, there's still cyclists coming past behind us. Uh, it's a tough day for them. The stage today ends with that huge climb and then a very technical descent. Uh, obviously, for, for a, a, a one of the back end of the field, uh, having that kind of mileage in your legs, tricky to, to descend technically. Definitely. I think um, the back markers, I have great respect for them as well. Because if you're in the saddle for that number of hours, your body is totally tired. And if you, you know, you're out there in the heat of the day, you're more, more dehydrated. Your legs have been working for hours longer. Um, and then you still have to try and keep your concentration so that you don't fall or make an error on those descents. And yes. I actually even have more respect for the back markers than the front guys who are also on the limit, but I think possibly more trained and it's, it's deeper in their blood. So the guys who are coming in now, kudos to you. I think it's a, a great effort. Mm. I think you, got, you, you mentioned early, earlier, Yolandi, uh, about you refueling yesterday, how, how important that is. Um, I, th I think you guys, have, of all you guys out there for three, four, five hours in a day, the guys are out there for 10 hours, and how, how critical is it to, to find that balance between the liquid refueling and actually eating on the bike? Um, is, is there something that, is it personal? Is it, uh, as you, uh, do you acquire it as you ride more and more in your training? So I think it's very important to um, constantly eat on the bike because obviously you're, um, you're riding hard and uh, that already puts a lot of, um, you can't, obviously when you're riding hard, blood has to go to your muscles and obviously if you're putting too much food into your stomach, you won't be able to di digest all the food. So it's better to eat small portions of food throughout the day. So I constantly, so I'll actually look at my, um, my Garmin monitor and I would say, okay, it's, it's an hour, I have to eat something because um, you forget. And uh, if you don't eat early or start eating early on, then you pay for it later on. So even for the back markets, uh, markets um, if you think about it, they're on their bikes during their 10 o'clock snack, lunch, the 4 o'clock snack. So obviously they have to eat. They're missing all their main meals. And um, even before I came down the technical descent, I actually ate a gel because I thought, sure, I have to concentrate going down here. <laughs> so <laughs> I feel for the, for the back markers. I mean, I mean, you're tired, you don't concentrate so well, and then still you have to navigate going down that. So respect to them. I must admit, I'm glad... I'm here now. <laughs> yeah. We're talking about nutrition and looking after yourself and, and recovery and drinks. Tell us, Teresa, about a police dog. <laughs> <laughs> this is a joke uh, between the cyclists, um, mainly men actually, because it's got to do with cramping. Us ladies, we, we seem to not cramp or at all or hardly ever. If you do catch a cramp, it's usually because your bike is set up incorrectly or some, something like that, it's not normal. But um, the boys talk about it a lot and they say the police dog's coming, the police dog's coming. And if you're not, if you're not careful, he's going to bite you. And that means that they can actually feel the cramps coming in their legs and they either need to, 
take something that will take the cramp away, a crampies or a rainies or something that will, will actually put more salt into their body at a rapid rate just to alleviate the police dog, <laughs> so to speak. Brilliant. Well, thanks very much for chatting to us. We hope that the police dogs stay, uh, keep at bay for the rest, for the, for the, for the rest of, the, of the week. And uh, best of luck to you. I, I hope you, uh, you have a, a great week. Thank, Thank you very, very much, much for having us on the show. Thank My you. pleasure. Thank you. All right, time now for the Dimension Data uh, Graphic. And this is uh, a wonderful new um, innovation provided by uh, DD or Dimension Data. It gives us an, uh, the analytics, the breakdown of the analytics. And today we're looking at the ladies' race, the analytics of the ladies' race. And uh, just a couple of uh, interesting facts provided in the data. And we're going to be uh, showing you that uh, graphic uh, right now. All right, there we have a look at the, the graphic. Mike, very, very interesting. Um, if you have a look at uh, the blue line is, uh, is Spur Specialized, yeah. Arena Anika, who had a, a fantastic comeback today. But interesting to see, uh, they started off really strongly, um, yeah. pushing hard, in fact, pushed harder than any of the teams um, for the I first 20 or 20 or 30 time, Ks. Yeah. yeah, and I think uh, maybe going out a little hard, then they had a really bad dip mm -hmm. until in sort of the 60 K stage. And then they started to increase all the way, and their performance continued um, to peak right the way through to the finish. I think, Jeff, it, uh, you know, looking at this graph, it, we, could, we could probably assume that uh, they identified the climbing as, uh, as a strength of theirs. Um, if you look at them going out hard on the first climbs, and then again just towards the end when they, when they hit the climbs again to really kind of lay down the, uh, the challenge to, to the rest of the teams uh, chasing them. Um, yeah. Topic, um, th they, th their situation and Spur. Topic also having a really good s solid start. Sport for good, on the other hand, um, from the start, uh, they Sitting they space. sort of had a, a steady uh, de decrease all the way, and um, I think they possibly went out a little bit too hard in the beginning. I think definitely, um, you know, looking at the looking at the graph. Um, it, it does sort of suggest that they may have tried to stick with uh, with uh, the Spurs Specialized team and uh, try to hold on for as long as possible, but that uh, kind of was a little bit too much in the beginning and uh, we started seeing them drop off. There we go. Well, that uh, provided the analytics by Dimension Data. And as I said, we will be getting uh, some analytics from them every day just to take an, an insight into what is happening within those teams. It is now time for the Riders Eye View and Sarah Haig, our um, Media and Communications Manager at the Absa Cape Epic, spent her time today at the Play Bike Wash and Bike Jump. And welcome to the Riders Eye View. While the riders are recovering in the Woolworths Recovery Zone, their bikes are being taken from them, washed and put away. Let's go see how the process works. So I'm standing here in the bike wash. I'm standing with Steve Lake, who is the bike wash and bike park manager. Steve, this looks like a great operation you have here. Can you tell me a bit more about it? Yeah, sure. It's been uh, pretty exciting. We bring our bikes in. They get washed on the stands, high-pressure hoses. We have a soaper guy that soaps them down using Motorex soap, which is biodegradable, by the way. We have a little pump in the corner there. That pump filters the water out, or sucks the water out, I should say. At the end of that, we, the hose pipe gets sent into the trees. We can do about 100 meters down the road. We can water things. There's a sock that filters the water, so it prevents the oils from coming out. Once the bikes are soaked, they get sprayed with high-pressure hoses. Once they're rinsed, they come out and they go through to the park section before they get scanned to go out. Once the bikes are in the bike park, the rider gets an SMS. Otherwise, this is where 1,200 bikes stay for the night. Thank you very much for joining. This is the Rider's Eye View. See you tomorrow.
Sarah Haig, our Media and Communications Manager at the Epsa Cape Epic, um, continuing to do a great job. Mike, behind the camera, what do you think? You might be losing a Media and Communications <laughs> person? Uh, Jeff, uh, Sarah's been with the team for good on 10 years now, and um, she's grown from looking after riders and all that, and I think I think we've uh, unleashed a new gem in the, in the um, roving reporter uh, domain. Um, she's done an exceptional job with the, with the portfolio, and I'm, I'm really enjoying her, her reporting of the race religion behind the scenes and I look forward to the rest of the week um, yeah we're gonna see lots more from Sarah right time now for the uh, tech talk the Land Rover technical terrain joined in studio today by a former Springbok Center and a former shark center Jeremy Thompson Jeremy welcome thank you for having me firstly good one on the sharks Absolutely. Winning, <laughs> winning uh, <laughs> the match against province. I've just made myself uh, very unpopular with all province supporters. I'm a Sharks supporter as well. That set the tone for the, for the epic, I can tell you that much. Um, we were sitting in the box with John Smith, and uh, it's been a tough, tough couple of years for him and for the Sharks, and uh, we really feel like we've got some momentum. So just that win really just uh, added the edge and gave us a nice... Um, uh, into the epic and our sort of uh, positive movement into the epic yeah jeremy talking of the epic i, I said to you earlier uh, off camera that people talk about joel stransky now and yourself i i don't really see you guys anymore as rugby players i see you people talk to me about joel and I'm, yeah joel the, the the epic rider i mean he used to play rugby well, well i hope what not what I mean is the reason well i hope you don't see us as rugby players i mean that was i think 15 years ago <laughs> but um uh, I think the guys just love cycling, uh, and uh, we love the epic. Um, and y you sort of want to make some comparisons between rugby and and sort of and the epic, and why the guys enjoy doing the epic. And I think they both sort of uh, reveal your character. Um, there's nowhere to hide between the four lines. So when you run onto the field in rugby, if you miss a tackle and a guy scores under the posts, there's nowhere to look. You know, you you, you can't blame your teammate or. And I think the epic's very much in the same vein where it's if there's any weakness, it'll find it out. It'll, it'll uncover it. Yeah. So I don't think you can go into it unprepared or think that uh, or be blasé about it. It's, it's hard work and dedication. And then obviously the reward, you know, winning a, winning a game is a huge reward. It's a team effort. The epic is a team effort. Um, so all those things sort of marry together. And, 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 and I think that's why rugby players really enjoy well professional rugby players put it that way really enjoy uh doing doing the epic um mm. because it brings out the character in you yourself and john riding for land rover um john is a big guy i mean joel stransky's a smallish guy like you like myself john's a really big guy we've got colin Chavis from Wales, who's a really big guy is it is it obviously a lot more difficult for them do you think your your size is uh, an abs advantage absolutely especially with the terrain that you've got this year um it suits guys like myself and joel and you could call it the backline players uh, the big forwards really really take a lot of strain um just getting up those climbs you know even if they've got a, a two by ten or or granny gears or whatever it's uh to put 100 kgs up a mountain is is it's a big ask we're looking at the descent into the Witzenberg uh, Valley on screen at the moment. Uh, Jeremy, that descent uh, coming uh, sort of fairly late in the race, uh, how did it feel? How was that on the legs for you? I don't know. I mean, I always get very excited about uh, the descents. Sorry, you want me to put it on? You can pop that on, yeah. We've, we've uh, got a, a little bit of uh, wind interference uh, happening here at the moment. Um, in fact, I think this uh, set's about to blow away. <laughs> but uh, yeah, the, the again, looking at the descent uh, on, on very tight legs, not an easy way to, to end the stage. No, it's not. And you've got you to maintain your composure and also concentration-wise, you really, really got to be on the ball. Um, and especially for those big guys, that momentum you get going and taking you down that mountain, you've got to be really, really careful. Mm. So, but uh, it's, it's always rewarding to have a descent close to the finish. Uh, I'm sure they'd take the descent over and above the a climb any day of the week. Okay, just looking at these graphics, that was the descent, I think, into the into the valley before water point one. But uh, as always, never, never easy. And an interesting thing that uh, Colin Chavis was saying yesterday, uh, he he was talking about lining up at the Absa Cape Epic. He said the only thing that could compare to standing in the Millennium Stadium for your country and listening to your national anthem was the feeling he got starting the, his first Absa Cape Epic. Yourself as a former Springbok, did you have that same sort of emotion? Um, 
No, I don't <laughs> no. I'll be totally honest, no. But uh um I, yeah, I, I think that, that those are two very different things. Yeah. Um one you're representing your country and I think the other one it's more about you and your personal uh sort of achievements and, and what you're trying to, to get out of it. Um but uh, put it this way, I mean as nerve wracking, absolutely. Uh so I, I can say on a par with in terms of uh, preparation for the epic, a preparation for a, a test match or a big game, very much the same. Yeah. Yeah. This is number five for you? Correct, and, yes. And yeah. where, where is it going to end? I don't know. I mean, I, I had the privilege of sharing a bit of the 100th stage with, with uh, Mark Nixon. Um, and, uh, yeah, so I don't know. He's done all, obviously, all 12 epics. And uh, so who knows uh, who, where it goes from here. Super. Congratulations on, on another stage finish today. And, and I hope uh, that you guys have a, have a good week going through. Yeah, um, thank you very much. Thanks for having me on the program. My pleasure. And we look forward to having you on Inside 8 Days of Courage after your number 10. <laughs> after <laughs> epic number 10. Thanks, there we guys. go. Thank you. <laughs> that Cheers. was uh, Jeremy Thompson. Time now for our epic Energade moment. And uh, as always, Energade bringing us a look back at some of the big epic moments of the day. Energade Moments. Energade, the official sports drink supplier to the Absa Cape Epic. <laughs> You're welcome, Tom. That, that was our <laughs> epic Energade moment of the day. And uh, time now for our celeb segment. We've got the last lines, or two of the last lines with us. The last lines, uh, two of the four riders who have completed every single Absa Cape Epic to date. And we welcome uh, Mike Nixon and John Gale. And uh, welcome, guys. Thank you. Thank you very much. Firstly... The obvious question, once again, how was today? Stage number 100 of the Epic? Yeah, it was. Uh, I think a lot of guys were thinking this was going to be a little bit easier than yesterday, and it ended up not being that. Um, up to water point two, everybody thought it was going to be relatively easy. And uh, after that, um, I was reminded today that it's the Ides of March, and I think somebody was stabbing the riders in the back <laughs> there towards <laughs> the end. It was a really tough finish to today's stage. Yeah, John? Why do you keep coming back? The reality is that having done this once doesn't mean you can do it again. And in fact, as Mike will tell you, to do a hundred of these in a row without something going wrong is, is very unlikely. And that, that's why there are so few of us left. And part of why you come back, I mean, I, I could tell you that the easy story is my wife had young children <laughs> and it was just much easier to be out here for 10 hours than back there for 10 hours a day was so you know that's kind of that was the push factor <laughs> but the the pull factor is that you, you never know if you're going to be able to do it again you know even if you did it yesterday you don't know whether you can do it tomorrow mm. and that's quite compelling it's also of course an amazing world-class event and and a, and a truly professional production uh, so if you add all that together you get something that's hard to resist mm. and a, a number of the riders that i've spoken to during the course of the day and asked them did stage 100 mean anything and they were the majority of them were like no it meant nothing all i could think about was was the 100 odd kilometers or the 96 kilometers stage 100 didn't mean anything in particular for you did that go through your mind this is stage number 100 if anyone is going to be affected by that bit of history it's going to be you guys yes of course we're aware that it's that it is 100 stages and it's and it is perhaps more so because of the publicity something that we're aware of um, but, and and for me i was feeling quite poorly this morning and so even more so than normal you know I, last night i didn't know whether i would be able to start and having started this morning i really didn't know whether i would finish so you know i think for all of us our experience of the day is so colored by these these other factors which come into play and then i started to feel a bit better as we got to the top of the pass and I loved it. So that descent was just fantastic. It was the best part of the day. Mm. Loved it. Yeah. Started to come alive again. 
Mike, you've stood on, on this, the top of the world, on the summit of Mount Everest, one of the few people that have done that. Give us a, a comparison to what you've achieved on the Epic and, and, and that experience. I think there's quite a few uh, similarities between the Epic and an event like uh, summiting Everest. Um, you've got the three issues which are your health, your nutrition, which is like everything to do with yourself. You've got your equipment, uh, which is very much a part of the epic, looking after your equipment. And as John said, to be able to get through a hundred stages without any equipment malfunctions, which stop you finishing, uh, bears testimony to that. And then the final one is the weather. You know, you never know what you're going to get in the weather. And certainly that's the same as, the, uh, as, uh, as climbing. But there is another ingredient that I think is quite important. Nobody summits Everest without fantastic support. In the Himalayas, it's the Sherpas. And here in, uh, for the Absa Cape Epic, it's the incredible support from all those unsung guys that are there, as Mike was talking about earlier, three o'clock in the morning, preparing the breakfast, getting the route ready, uh, organizing things that we don't even think about when we're on the ride, that they do. And that's the reason it's, uh, it's so unique and such a pleasure to keep coming back again. Okay, and you've also done some work with Kingsley Holgate. Tell us about that. I saw he was actually, um, I think, a guest at the Absa Tent. I saw him in the Absa Tent a few days ago. That's right. He was here uh, for the first part of the Epic as a guest of Land Rover. And uh, yes, recently we've just been to the, um, uh, we ran an expedition to the geographic center point of the African continent. Um, it was quite a unique expedition in that it took about six months of work with the um, International Geographic Union and UCT to establish exactly where this point was. Um, it ended up being in the northeast part of the Republic of Congo, in the middle of an equi e e e equatorial rainforest, in a swamp. And of all the seven continents in the world, uh, we wondered why the African continent was the last, and this had never been found before this unique geographic se center point. Um, when we got there, we found out why. It is probably the most inaccessible point I've ever been to. It took uh, seven Barker pygmy tribesmen <laughs> to carry our kit in. There were snakes, there was, I mean, it was a real wonderful, adventurous expedition. A world first, and uh, yes, through the Kingsley Olgate Foundation, it's with the humanitarian work that we do with it, it's uh, uh, changing and improving lives through those adventurous expeditions. It was a, a wonderful event. And I have to ask you, is there any leaning from Kingsley to maybe saying, I want to do this epic. Well, Kingsley turned 70 uh, last week, and um, that's quite an interesting number, 70 years wow. old. Because I don't know whether John knows that uh, if we want to get another interview, which is quite pleasant to sit here and have an interview, <laughs> we're going to have to do another 100 stages. And that means that it'll be in 2029 when I'll be 70. So uh, I think we'll probably, uh, that's a lot of commitment for an interview. <laughs> there we have it, Mike Nixon, John Gale. Guys, congratulations. Um, and I hope you have a trouble-free run. Um, you need to finish this one as well. But congratulations and thanks very much for joining us. Best of luck for the remaining days. Thanks for having us on the show. Thank you very much. Time now for our fly-throughs, and uh, this is going to uh, take us through the entire epic and then uh, having a look at what we can expect for tomorrow's Stage 3 from Tilbach to Wellington. Stage 3. This is the route manager's favourite stage of the week. Like on Stage 2, you'll have some free kilometres to warm up the legs with the first 14 kilometres tracing farm, district and some tar roads. The first test of the day comes at 17 kilometres the three kilometer waterfall climb. It's a tough one with some steep sections at close to 20% gradient. The surface is good for the most part but you will need to pick your line carefully on some of the looser and rockier sections. From here you will descend into the Surflakter, a once forested but now desolate bowl where you will find the first water point at 22 kilometers. Crossing the valley floor will be tough if there is a headwind and it's pretty certain that there'll be some sandy section here too. Ride conservatively as you descend, approaching the Land Rover technical terrain section for the day. It'll take you on a seldom used road through pristine nature reserve. This beauty does come at a price, so caution is necessary through the rocky sections here. There is a sandy river crossing at the bottom of the descent, which you may need to portage. 
but Water Point 2 is close by at 52 kilometers. The main obstacle on the route profile is Bainskloof Pass, a long tarred climb perfect for finding a good rhythm and maybe some company as well. The main part of the climb is 7 kilometers long, but the gradient is pretty mild. From the top you'll be able to see Wellington, but do not get it too excited as there is still plenty of riding to come, including more climbing. After the tar descent, you will head up to the Valfenpass trails and up the WFT climb through the plantation. You'll be rewarded with the flowing Super G single track descent, downhill all the way to Water Point 3 at 87 kilometers. From here to the finish, there's a mix of superb single track, some farm roads, and one final climb at 95 kilometers. Then it's downhill all the way through the vineyards to the race village. And that's what the riders have got to look forward to tomorrow on stage three of the Absa Cape Epic, uh, the 101st stage in the history of this amazing race. And uh, as always, some wonderful opportunities for spectators to go along tomorrow and to enjoy the scenery. And, and two spectator points tomorrow, Mike. There's Bergsachsella, which was affected by fires uh, previously, but I think the, the area is obviously now good to go. And that includes one of my favorite areas, Bainscliffe Pass. Um, a beautiful Absolutely. Space. Um, Jeff, I've done quite a bit of uh, riding, uh, staying only 30 k's away from, from Velfin Pass and, and the trails there in Bainscliffe. Uh, I love that pass. It's um, there's just something, there's, there's this energy that's there and I think the riders are in for something special tomorrow when, when, they, when they head there. And isn't there a section, there's a tar section as well? There's a tar section and uh, let me tell you, that they, they do pace it up, <laughs> up those tar sections. These guys, they love the off-road but when they hit a bit of tar, Trust the me, they open it up. The part of the tar section that, that make comes to mind is Henriette Skuman rode this race with Joel Stransky, and she had a horrible epic. By her own admission, she really wasn't happy on the, on the bike, on the dirt bike. And suddenly, she said she found herself on tar, and she suddenly felt at home, and Joel said she just leapt up out of her seat and took off like a rocket. <laughs> so I always remember that. The other spectator point is the Acre. It's a firm favorite with, with spectators and, and families. And the Borovos rolls are amazing. It's legendary. And just by the way, if you're from Europe, if you're watching the screening from Europe and you don't know what a Borovos roll is, it's Borovos translated as a farmer's roll, so it's kind of your bratwurst. But that's what it's famous for tomorrow. Absolutely. I think there's, um, you know, one thing, Jeff, our, our, um, our water points have really become satellite race villages. They're, they're growing um, in stature and, and the number of spectators that we get out there every year and each day of the week is, is something special. There we go and just be sure if you want to go to uh, these spectator points tomorrow please make sure that you get there fairly early and uh, get yourself a, a good position. All right, uh, time now uh, to just uh, wrap things up. Uh, Mike, if I can just ask you, looking at the, the rest of the week, um, what are you expecting to play out? Obviously, a busy, a busy week ahead for the crews. Absolutely. I mean, we've got a move. We've got a move coming up um, in the next day or so, and uh, then we we get an opportunity to to, to test our, our um, skills and, and setting up a new village. Um, but for the riders, they they're really heading into some amazing territory, some some great trails. Um, there's going to be a couple of testing climbs. Um, the racing. Those front guys, the, the race is really wide open and it's, uh, it's, it's going to be good to watch. Mm. That's it. And uh, we do apologize once again for this wind. As I said, it's getting increasingly stronger. So for all the wind interference that you are hearing in the microphones at the moment, we do apologize. There's not much we can do with uh, Mother Nature. That is it from uh, this episode of Inside 8 Days of Courage. Uh, be sure to tune in every day from 4.30 to quarter past five, where we will be bringing you uh, some of uh, the gems uh, to find out what is going on. From me, Jeff Aliff, and from Michael Flynn, uh, who's with me today. We look forward to seeing you at the same time tomorrow. Have a fantastic evening.